Greetings and welcome to the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs at Georgetown University. We are delighted that you have all joined us for today's session on Ukrainian religious actors and organizations after Russia's invasion, the struggle for peace. My name is Peter Mandeville, and I'm a senior research fellow here at the Berkeley Center. I also have the honor to serve as the co-chair of the Advisory Council of the Transatlantic Policy Network on Religion and Diplomacy, or TPNRD, which is the program at the Berkeley Center sponsoring today's event. The TPNRD is an informal network of diplomats and foreign ministry officials from countries in Europe and North America whose official portfolios focus on the intersection of religion and diplomacy. The TPNRD uh, has an academic secretariat that, that supports its work, which is based uh, here at Georgetown University. And we are delighted uh, to be able to bring you uh, today's session focused on Ukraine. Um, I want to acknowledge the support of the Henry Luce Foundation, um, whose uh, resources kindly support the work of the TPNRD Advisory Council, as well as to acknowledge the contributions of Dr. Judd Birdsall, the Executive Director of the Academic Secretariat of the network, as well as Dr. Aaron Wilson from the Groningen University in the Netherlands, uh, who is my uh, uh, co-chair, my colleague as co-chair of the network's Advisory Council. Most of all today, I'm grateful to our speakers and want to welcome them. Um, the uh, presentation that you'll be hearing today is based on a newly published report um, from TPNRD uh, that is available uh, on the Berkeley Center's website. I'll be providing a link to it um, as the presentations begin. Um, I'm delighted that joining us from the uh, area near Kyiv in Ukraine are the two um, co-authors of the paper, Drs. Tatyana Pelenichenko and Denis Brilov. Good morning, or rather good afternoon to both of you. Good morning to you. Um, I'm yeah, also, good morning. Good morning, Denis. Good afternoon. Um, good afternoon, I'm also, yeah. <laughs> I'm also delighted that we have joining us today on the panel um, Professor Jose Casanova. Uh, many of you know Professor Casanova as one of the world's foremost uh, sociologists of religion. Um, what I did not know until one morning when I walked past his office uh, in 2019 and heard him speaking fluent Ukrainian is that he also knows a thing or two about religion in Ukraine. Uh, Dr. Casanova is a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center and professor emeritus at Georgetown University. Before turning to our speakers, I wanted to provide you with a little bit of information about uh, the format of today's program. Uh, we'll begin with a presentation of the, the paper, um, uh, followed by um, some responses and remarks uh, by Professor Casanova. Um, uh, you as our audience are welcome to participate in the conversation at any point using the Q&A button uh, there on your Zoom control panel. At any point during the presentation, please feel free to type your question in. Uh, and after we hear from our speakers, um, I will be putting a selection of these questions to the panel. I also wanted to make sure that all of you are aware that today's session uh, is being recorded and everyone who registered for the session will receive, receive a link to that recording once it goes live. So without further ado, let me hand over to Dr. Kalenichenko uh, to start the presentation. Um, rather than um, in, or, in order to maximize the time that we have available, rather than reading their biographies out to you, I will be putting into the chat room a link to, to their bio so that you can learn more about their background and expertise. So please, Dr. Glenichenko, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Peter, and thank you everyone for coming. It's an honor for me to present the Berkeley Center together with Denis Bredo. And I will just pass uh, my short word to Denis just to greet <laughs> our participants. Uh. Okay, uh, to word, uh, hello everyone, good, good morning or good evening, uh, where are you? And I am Denis Brilov, uh, together with Tatiana, we represent at the European Center for Strategic Analytics. Uh, 
and uh, we are co-authors uh, this report. I am a psychologist and anthropologist of religion, and I was studying about religion organization in Ukraine in state of war, in time of war is social activities and other activities, uh, Orthodox Church, Protestants, uh, other religion organization. And we now and planned in future, studying this question, studying this uh, field. And now it's short <laughs> for me. And now I give the floor to Tatiana. Thank you so much. So as Denis mentioned, uh, our report is based on both academic research and field analysis. And that's a key point for us. As soon as we get to a lot of field materials from our dialogue and peace building practices. I will tell you more in the next slides, but it also based on our academic research, which was doing in long term since 2014 and 15. So just in short, uh, we are still in times of war and just to uh, recognize it, we still get all the dynamics. And this report was made mainly in June this year, but it was upgraded till that, uh, that time and this day, but actually every day, even tomorrow, we can change the dynamics and the overall landscape of religious organizations and overall situation in Ukraine. And uh, just to start with, in, for example, in June, I've got more than 80 religious sites were ruined uh, because of war. Uh, and full-scale invasion after 24th of February. But now we've got more than 190 officially statistics uh, ruined religious sites. And you can see one of the examples on the photo. And uh, we are actually situated uh, um, located in Kyiv region, uh, but also travel into different regions in Ukraine. And hopefully we'll provide more uh, like overall conclusions since this period of time, last seven months of activities and overall trends, which we can see from our qualitative analysis. So what do we got after 2014? Because it's not the first wave of the war and religious representatives there. Of course, we've got new waves of activism struggles since then time and especially after February, 2022, and for example, one of the key examples, I would say, is that before, if we've got military chaplains on the front line as representatives of religious organizations, and they've got a lot of dilemmas and doubts, should they take weapon or not, should, how they should serve, what are the key theological points for them? Right now, they do not get all those doubts and uh, theological discussions. They are postponed because some of them actually are now serving in the army, not as chaplains, but as soldiers. And that's one of the key changes, I would say. It's not about radicalization of the clergy, but it's about their strong position on the side of the country. And of course, if you can see in the report, officially, uh, almost all religious organizations uh, were taken pro-Ukrainian position and supporting country in defense uh, by their believers. And that's one of the situations which we've got, especially in the orthodoxy. Of course, uh, there are much more than before, eight years before, uh, deep divisions with Russian religious organizations. If before, since 2014, we get some informal meetings, for example, in Istanbul, some indirect contacts with religious leaders and believers, if there are several attempts to get any kind of mutual theology discussions of ongoing political changes. Right now, almost all those networks are ruined because of political positions and because, of course, of the struggles and uh, official state uh, of Russia position against some religious organizations and especially in Protestant world. We still uh, remain main patriotic, so-called patriotic discourse and hate language against those who are not patriotic and sitting on the side of Ukraine inside the country. And it could be explained, of course, by ongoing shellings and killings. And also, uh, there is huge search for international support 
and sometimes only religious actors are those trusted organizations that are helping a lot. But the main news, of course, which we can see from Ukraine in religious field right now, is that the dilemma of Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate and Orthodox Church of Ukraine, as it's called by uh, ordinary believers as Ukrainian Patriarchate. So you can see on the uh, this to Metropolitan Anouf and Metropolitan Epiphany as the two heads of those churches. And there's still like, like this inter-church situation. It's like representing almost all dynamics in religious and social worlds in Ukraine because of their different positions, different public narratives, and complicated situation inside churches. What do we mean by them? Because we've got different dilemmas in the religious world in connection to the war. And of course, in Ukrainian Orthodox Church now, they are uh, publicly as an image of enemy together uh, with deep crisis inside the church structures because every church, not only Orthodox, is not one in their own position. It's not only uh, pro-Ukrainian, only pro-Russian. It's all depending to different religious leaders on the ground. And there is deep division inside the church community, and especially in Ukrainian Orthodox Church today. Uh, of course, their council on 27th of May, where some researchers are claiming that's only like public attempt to um, justify themselves and to be as pro-Ukrainian seems as more neutral and standing against Moscow, just for those who are not in Orthodoxy so much. Uh, in this council on 27th of May, Ukrainian Orthodox Church claimed that they're independent from Moscow Patriarchate and be um, autocephaly, auto another autocephalic church in Ukraine. But now we're still waiting for official changes in their statutes, in their documents, and of course in canonical right. And still we've got that situation that we do not get uh, two official churches, and according to canonical law, it's still unclear what the status of Ukrainian Orthodox Church right now, and uh, how it's possible to explain for ordinary believers, because those people who are not theologians, who are not so inside the church life, they couldn't understand the difference sometimes, and still there are big clash and changes of uh, local parishes that are transferring to Orthodox Church of Ukraine, now near 150 parishes from February 2022. Of course, they're a much bigger number, but officially not all of them just finished that process of transferring because it's complicated and sometimes it's uh, just continuing with some physical uh, clashes on the ground and of course a lot of hate language and claiming that someone is pro-Russian and others are pro-Ukrainian. But still, we've got this call for full independence from Russian Orthodox Church, some hope for ecumenical patriarchy and personally patriarch Bartholomew to understand how it's possible to reunite and to recover the schism. And uh, one official attempt in uh, July, uh, thanks to the State Department of Religion Affairs, uh, to have dialogue with Orthodox Church of Ukraine, but still this process is so much complicated. And it's not officially done as it was before uh, till the time of Metropolitan Volodymyr Sabodan, as an example. And of course, uh, here you can see the map just to understand how it's going on in different regions of Ukraine. This map was done on 4th of March 2022. And you can see those regions on the western Ukraine, they're in green. Those parishes of Ukrainian Orthodox Church that were standing for autocephaly on their hierarchical level, then uh, those uh, regions marked in yellow, those were not naming Patriarch Kirill anymore during the liturgy, uh, then uh, regions in red, those uh, against changes and against independence from Russia, and uh, those in gray and blue, they were still neutral. And I would say that this issue of neutrality of those churches is still the same, like, what do you mean by your neutrality? Why, what do you mean by this, this complicated situation? And just to add more dilemmas, because, of course, the process of war opens up a lot of questions. 
I would say that there is uh, naming it like full dilemma, and especially after Easter 2022. And you can see those images and pictures, like memes from Ukrainian Facebook and internet, uh, claiming that it's not possible now to get, talk about reconciliation with Russians at all. And even Catholic Church couldn't be this way of peace building, especially now where we get active phase of war. And still it's not clear for some Roman Catholics and for some Greek Catholics in Ukraine what popes actually mean by different official statements. And they really ask him to get any kind of support and clarifications. What do we mean and what do we see in theological perspective and our spiritual perspective while we get ongoing war in Ukraine? And just to add more dilemmas, it's uh, more from Protestant world because Ukraine and Russian Protestants before 2014 were strongly connected and they uh, were more connected through horizontal networks. As soon as Protestant churches in Ukraine are not in big unions, of course, there are several of them, but they are uh, much more independent on their local level as a small communities. And they're really influential and their believers are really active in their political positions. And one of the key, uh, key questions now for Protestants, just to explain what's going on with their brothers in Russia, why, for example, there are still churches that were opened during the summer period of time in Mariupol by Russian Protestants, claiming that they are actually saving people from Ukraine, Nazis, and how it could be explained through church documents. And what do you see on the photo? Why I put this billboard here? Actually, you can see a translation on the slide that we must repent for abortions, that God may have mercy on Ukraine. That's one of the way of explanation. This, I would say, above conflict spiritual position, which we've got in different religious organizations, that we are the people who are guilty for this war because we're sinners. And just because of our sin, we cannot get any kind of peace or victory because we're not enough spiritual in that way. So we've got different trends and dilemmas, of course, and we've got several pastors who went to fight on the front line because there is a strong ethical dilemmas, which we take personally, of course, and on the level of spiritual communities. So how should we act and how should we impact on uh, everyday events? And after this period of time, we've got a wave of new sacred symbols. I would say that's more interesting. Uh, that's uh, more about women at war and about mother at war. And you can see on this photo, a woman was injured uh, during the shelling and then in this image of Virgin Mary and even more. Uh, that's one of the examples of the women sitting in Kiev somewhere during the air alarm and shellings of Kiev. And she was made almost like an icon. You can see on the second photo on a cube subway map. And on the third photo, is it's uh, almost icon was used for Easter 2022 in Naples, Italy. So those images and those secularization of some uh, resistance of Ukrainians are taken as spiritual, even abroad. And it's really interesting to understand how those symbols are used and what's our spiritual clarifications uh, of the sound. And there are more uh, women images. And one of the main critical uh, for all Ukrainian council of churches and religious organizations, you can see this almost icon or picture of Saint Javelin as protector of Ukraine. And it was highly criticized by religious leaders because they said like, how we could actually use any kind of sacred images for weapon and especially naming javelin as a weapon, a sent javelin. And there are a lot of issues how we can actually separate, or should we, or how it's possible to separate spirituality from ongoing war and uh, all those everyday dilemmas. And of course, we've got self-sacralized images from the other side. So you can see those main military temple in Moscow, uh, dedicated to different religions, but mainly Orthodox, and some Orthodox um, 
Brett, I don't know who translate uh, correctly, like Pascha for Easter 2022 with Z as a symbol of the Russian army today. But more to say, in order to conclude, there are, of course, several possibilities how it's uh, possible to see those friends. And uh, of course, we've got public statements by, as I said, all Ukrainian Council for uh, of churches and religious organizations. There are really strong horizontal networks of connections. And uh, together with secular initiatives, secular volunteers, what we've got is a strong civil and religious resistance of religious uh, believers and leaders on the ground. They opened a lot of shelters, hub, uh, a religious object to host refugees even abroad, spreading humanitarian aid, serving as medicals and soldiers and military chaplains. Uh, keep going on educational programs and uh, being flexible for their students in seminaries. And of course, uh, there are recent two attempts to find theological explanations of ongoing war, uh, and mainly by Protestants. For example, one meeting was just months ago in uh, Bucha, and it called Theology After Bucha. And another one was just yesterday, and use theology in Zakarpatia, because uh, several Christian theologians united just to explain by themselves what do we mean by theology at war. And there are strict dividers that are still going on since 2014 and 13, even after Maidan protests. And you can see on the photo uh, this uh, quite interesting image why I claim about politicization of religious actors and organization because on this board it say like Moscow or something from Moscow kills and you can see the image of uh, metropolitan Ukraine. There is still reactional model for religious leaders not so much as before but mainly religious organizations are just reacting on some main events but not leading the uh, responses not leading actions because they are still waiting for something to be and then to react as for example we saw it with istanbul convention uh voting in ukrainian parliament for several years there's still strong uh, claim on religious affiliation in order to emphasize the difference but if we are taking into account horizontal networks of cooperation they are mainly interreligious, but not inside one church network. So it's more easy for one Orthodox priest to cooperate with Protestant pastor or Muslim leader on the ground than with the other Orthodox priest from his church because of their internal interpersonal conflicts. We still got the high level of religious competition, no shared vision of peace or any kind of strategy for churches, of course, hate sharing and language because we're all human beings and especially in social media, that's a lot. And some silent responses to social concerns because as a classical example, which I heard myself in 2017 and it's still more actual up to date, uh, one mother with five children was asking an Orthodox priest. So three of my son are fighting in Ukrainian army. Two of them are fighting in Donetsk People's Republic Army. For whom and how I should pray for them? And that's an actual dilemma which people are still getting from the ground, from their own families, because so, some families are really divided, and especially if they get relatives in Russia. And of course, there are some really strong connectors. As we said, uh, from the state level, guaranteed monetary religious balance. And I know that Professor Casanova put a lot of attention on this, keeping this balance. And I still think that it's really important to keep this balance because it could be a protector for religious fear. Of course, uh, religious leaders on the ground get wise social and cultural capital. They're trusted people and churches are the most trusted together with volunteers and army today in, for Ukrainian society. They still create moral codes and they get new religious generation and clergy who are more ready to respond for those dilemmas. And uh, they're still doing common actions and statements. Possible solutions for this um, ongoing process. Uh, mainly, uh, just to summarize what is written on a slide, 
it's important to understand and to be conscious on uh, the processes which we've got today in our society and to think about it through social political prism and through, through theological background, just to understand it, explain what do we mean by that in spiritual level, and also to be more detailed and to empower and strengthen those horizontal networks of cooperation, because we've got really strong uh, tradition of those cooperation, interreligious cooperation mainly, and it's really important to emphasize it. And of course, those, I would say, soft power of solid networks works a lot. And actually on this photo, you can see just everyday uh, stuff of one of the priests who is military chaplain on the front line. And uh, our response, and I saw that uh, we've got Lydia Lozova in our participants, and I'm grateful that uh, she's here because we actually started together our Dialogue Connection initiative from 2016. And it's aimed uh, to establish those religious cooperation networks, but also to connect it with secular networks. And just in turn, not to, uh, to take a lot of time for questions, I would summarize with this hopeful photo for me, because uh, last year, for one year, we got inter-chaplains, inter-Christian meetings. And here are one of the photos of the final meeting. So here you can see military chaplains from Roman Catholic Church, Greek Catholic Church, uh, Orthodox Church of Ukraine, and different Protestant churches. And they are all united. And we were united for one year, uh, talking about peace building possibilities, theological dilemmas, and understanding how it's possible to build up theology of peace and theology of war. Because any day, well, our war ends, and then we will get much more questions than even now, because we need to understand how to live long, and especially through the prism of religious organizations who could be real leaders on the ground. Thank you for your attention, and hopefully I could explain more if you've got questions. Great. Thank you so much, Tatiana. And it's, it's nice to see that hopeful image that you, that you ended with. Um, I uh, would love now to hand over to my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Jose Casanova, uh, to hear his thoughts on these questions. I'll just remind our audience members that at any time you can type a question into the Q&A box. We, we already have a good number that have, have come in, um, and we'll put a selection of those questions to our panel um, at the conclusion. So without further ado, Professor Casanova, over to you. Okay, thank you, Peter, my dear friend. Uh, it's a great pleasure. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to participate in this uh, discussion, very important event, presenting the religious uh, response to the war. Uh, let me congratulate uh, Tetiana Kalenechenko for her presentation and Tetiana and Denis Brilov for the wonderful report that they've put together. I urge all of you to read the report carefully, which is available on the Berkeley Center website. Um, it is very important to begin with the recognition that this war has a very important religious element, that it was the invasion was justified as a protection, as a defense of holy rules against enemies against enemies of the Holy Rus in Ukraine, namely Ukrainian nationalists, and against enemies of the Ruski Mir abroad the West. It was this theology of the Ruski Mir arguing that uh, the Rus, Holy Rus, is this united land that includes Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. And therefore, within this theolo theology, there is no room for independent Ukraine much less for Ukrainian religious groups which do not belong to the Moscow Patriarchate. So this is very important. The very principle of Holy Rus does not allow for Ukrainian Orthodox churches to exist or for the Greek Catholic, Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church to exist, and for that matter, Protestant groups to exist in Ukraine. And of course, we know that this is what happened when uh, the Soviet Union invaded uh, our uh, annex Western Ukraine, immediately both the Greek Catholic Church and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church were eliminated. And the Moscow Patriarchate has never 
regretted or expressed any remorse for the bloody elimination of so many priests and so many faithful. And the plan was, if the invasion would succeed, the same would have happened today to the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, to the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, and to many Protestant groups, as has happened after the invasion of Crimea in the annexation and after the beginning of the war in Donbass in 2014. Namely, we must understand these uh, theological, religious dimension of the war. Uh, the other element of the Holy Rus, of course, is that Russia is defending traditional Christian values against modern liberalism, secularism, feminism, LGBTQ rights, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, again, it's a holy war against, if you wish, the devil. Uh, it's important to recognize this because this is what precisely the letter of, of over 400 Orthodox theologians did when they criticized this heretic political theology of the Ruski Mir as unchristian, as Manichean. Now, this is one aspect of the, of the religious dimension of the war. The other is, of course, the one that Tatiana has uh, presented so uh, vividly. It's a great depiction of the very, very complex uh, Ukrainian religious field and a very accurate also description of the response of each of the religious groups in Ukraine. Now, we must understand that when Glasnost started in 89 in Ukraine, at the time there was only one officially recognized church in Soviet Ukraine, namely the Russian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchy. You could not be member of any other church. All of them were underground or repressed. But then when Glasnost came, you have the emergence of three churches within Orthodoxy, the rebirth of the Greek Catholic Church, the rebirth of the Jewish communities as religious groups, not as national minorities, of the Muslims, and of course, of many, many Protestant groups. Uh, Ukraine always was the Bible Belt, already uh, the, the, the most important Baptist uh, uh, land of all of Europe, uh, and the Bible Belt of the Soviet Union. So this all uh, re-emerged with Ukrainian independence. The most important aspect of this, what, what uh, um, uh, created multi-religious or granted multi-religious violence in Ukraine is AUKRO, the All Ukrainian Council of Churches and Religious Organizations. This organization organized from below, although originally it was promoted by the state, but it is really an organization of civil society. All the main church and religious communities belong, 15 of them, uh, all the Orthodox groups and the Roman Catholics and the Greek Catholics and many different Protestant groups and the Armenian church, Orthodox church and the Jews and the Muslim communities. The important thing is the presidency of this organization rotates every six months so that every six months, a different religious community chairs the presidency of this organization. Right now, in times of war, it has happened that the chair of the, of the organization is the Armenian Orthodox Church, a very small community in Ukraine, and yet it has equal weight in this organization. This is probably the most important organization of religious life in Ukraine, because although it is true that it has not been as active as it could be, nonetheless, it really, really played a crucial role already during the Maidan, in supporting the Maidan. And even in the last two years before the war, they were very much engaged in uh, not in lobbying parliament individually, the different religious communities for whatever they wanted, but in developing a moral consensus that they could bring then to the debates in the legislation in Ukraine. And this is one of the most important aspects in which in Ukraine, churches do not are not lobbying groups that go to parliament to present their own interests, but actually they work together consensually. Now, consensus, of course, means a very difficult process, and indeed it's a very slow, and sometimes it's not sufficiently effective because if there is no consensus, then there is no action. Uh, but nonetheless, I think that this is very important uh, to, to view the importance of this, of this organization. Now, uh, Tetiana has pointed out 
the importance of this uh, uh, multi-religious balance, precisely the fact that there is not one hegemonic church under which then the other religious minorities somehow are protected. Uh, thanks to the fact, and this is one of the paradoxes, right? It's a tragedy, if you wish, for Ukrainian orthodoxy that it is so divided, so polarized, and actually uh, with a lot of hostility. All the interreligious conflicts in Ukraine are really within orthodoxy. Very little between all the other religious communities. In this respect, all the other religious minorities play a very important role in creating this kind of interreligious, uh, 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 let's say, favorable uh, situation in which there are no interreligious conflicts. And I actually think that the best would be if there would be no immediate unification of the two Orthodox churches today. Of course, we all hope that they will be able to reconcile, to learn to live together charitably as sister churches, but without unification yet for two reasons. Because unification today could only happen one taking over the other, and we don't want to have that. Uh, actually, the uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church that has been until now with the Moscow Patriarchate and canonically is, has not yet broken with it. They want to have independence, autonomy, but obviously Moscow doesn't want to give them autocephaly and without it, and if they do not want to join the ecumenical patriarch and not want to join the already organized canonical Orthodox Church of Ukraine under Epiphany, then obviously uh, it's better that it doesn't happen. Also, the union, because the Ukrainian Orthodox Church that has been part of the Moscow Patriarchate until now, it has much uh, fewer faithful. Today, probably the proportion of people who is claimed to be affiliated with this church is well below 10%, probably around 5%. It has diminished since uh, it may have been equal to the other church or to the what was before the KU Patriarchate uh, until the war in Donbass, but especially since the Thomas that established the new church as a canonical church, the faithful of the Moscow Patriarchate have diminished and it happened even more after the war. It was about 12, 14% before the war, now probably is well below 10%, uh, close to 5%. Um, in this respect, the majority of the population in Ukraine, roughly 72, 75% are Orthodox. This has not changed in the last 30 years. Uh, if you add a 10%, 9, 10% of Ukrainian Greek Catholics, you have that the majority of uh, uh, the population is Eastern, of Eastern Christianity. Sensibility, liturgy, the Greek Catholics are united to, to, the, to the Bishop of Rome. Uh, uh, juridically, but in liturgy, in spirituality, in theology, are very much close to the Orthodox uh, tradition. So in this respect, the majority of the population is Orthodox, but many of them didn't want to take side and claim to be simply Orthodox because they didn't want to take sides between the two competing churches. We hope that this can be somehow uh, lead to reconciliation without unification. My fear of unification would be that now a new a he hegemonic national church that Christ tries to establish close relations with the state and becomes basically a state national church, which then uh, brings the minorities to a second class category of religious citizens. I think that Ukraine has had the, if you wish, the fortune of after the Soviet Union, creating the most pluralist, the most open-ended uh, religious feeling all of Europe, not only in, in Western or Eastern Europe. And we hope that out of the war, uh, uh, this condition will be maintained. Uh, uh, it was very important, the picture that we saw of all the military chaplains together, of all the denominations. This was the picture one could also experience during the Maidan, when you had prayers, and funerals that were multi-confessional, multi-denominational, any funeral of any of the hundred people that were killed during the Maidan took place uh, uh, with basically prayers from all the religious denominations, Muslims, Jewish, uh, 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 Armenians, 
all the Orthodox, Greek Catholics, Roman Catholics, etc. And this also the condition actually of the chaplaincy, because those are started as voluntary chaplains, although now they have been incorporated into uh, a civil service, if you wish, but nonetheless, it's very much a chaplaincy from below, in which the chaplains are not chaplains for their own faithful, but for all the Ukrainian soldiers. And this happens not only with, with, with uh, uh, Greek Catholics and Orthodox, but also with Protestants and with Muslims and with, uh, and with Jewish rabbis that also uh, help precisely uh, uh, soldiers uh, spiritually in time of war. And the same you could experience how each of the religious communities during the war have served as a refugee centers for all Ukrainians. I happened to accompany a delegation, international delegation of religious leaders to visit KU in uh, mid-May, 23rd, 24th of May. It was an invitation of the mayor of, of, of um, Kiev, uh, Vitaly Klitschko. And we went, uh, it was a delegation mainly of actually uh, uh, non-Orthodox, non-Roman Catholics, although I myself am a Roman Catholic, but I went almost representing the Greek Catholics. And, and again, we met with the rabbis, we met with the Tatars, we met with the Greek Catholics. The Greek Catholics play a crucial role in mediating religious differences, so they are the ones that can talk to both Orthodox branches, and in this respect, they play a crucial role in uh, uh, somehow alleviating the animosity between the two Orthodox churches. But it became very clear that it is the isolation of the Orthodox church. And I'm talking because this is a, a, a session about diplomacy and religion. It was the failure of all the international religious groups, all the ecumenical groups, because of the pressure of the, of the Moscow Patriarchate not to recognize the new Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which happens to be the largest Christian community in Ukraine, the largest church in Ukraine, that precisely has been isolated internationally. And even the Pope, the Pope precisely uh, because of the resistance, uh, uh, because of their willingness to have relations with the Moscow Patriarchate, the price was whenever it was an ecumenical meeting, uh, there will be always present uh, uh, Metropolitan Ilarion and the Moscow Patriarchate, but the condition was no presence of Ukrainian Orthodox, no presence of Greek Catholics. And this is a situation that has to be very much alleviated. It has been alleviated in the last two months, particularly since the meeting of the World Council of Churches in Karlsruhe. There has been now formal meetings of this church, of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, with uh, British authorities, uh, 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 there was a meeting between the Strati, which is the representative of the Church of Foreign Affairs, with uh, Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, just last week, there was a meeting uh, organized by Religious for Peace in uh, Japan, uh, uh, precisely where you had together uh, uh, Archbishop Yevstrati from the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, Father Ihor Chavan, who is the ecumenical uh, uh, chair of relations for the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, and Olena Bogdan, which is the, depart the state representative of the Committee for Ethnic and Religious Affairs, all three together in Tokyo. This is what was not possible when our delegation visited KU. At first, Olena Bogdan would not meet the delegation, and the delegation would not meet with the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. So we need, there can be no peace in Ukraine without the Orthodox. The Orthodox are the primary and has to be the primary peacemakers in Ukraine. First, they have to make peace among themselves, true, but also all the other international groups, beginning with the Catholic Church, has to start really seriously talking and communicating with Ukrainian Orthodoxy if we want to have peace in Ukraine. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Jose. I really appreciate your analysis and explanation of all of the complexities around the question of the unification of the various Ukrainian Orthodox groups. Um, we have a wonderfully rich set of questions that have come in, and I noticed that Dr. Kalenichenko has already been very generously active in the chat box answering some of them. Um, 
I, I think it's possible to group them into um, some clear themes. Um, so my apologies in advance to those of you, if I have to abbreviate your question a little bit, um, just in the interest of fitting in as many as possible. Um, I promise that our panelists will see the full versions of all of your questions, including the ones that we don't get to. So I'm gonna pose a few of them to, to the panel, um, prioritizing those questions that explore different dimensions of some of the themes that have already come up. And so I wanted to first um, ask a question uh, or uh, uh, to pose two questions that are both about um, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church Moscow Patriarchate. Um, the first question is to ask about the presence of generational divides between younger and older priests within the UOC MP, um, about uh, the question of maintaining close ties with the Moscow Patriarchate. Do we see these kinds of generational differences? Second question about the UOC MC is about how uh, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church is perceived by the Ukrainian military. Is the UOC MP seen as a voice of the Kremlin? Are they considered somehow to be enemies or ab abettors of the Russian invasion? Um, and is there a difference between how the UOC MP is perceived by the military versus the civilian population of Ukraine? So why don't we start with those two? With orthodoxy, yeah, thank you, Peter. Uh, and maybe we could add more a question on chaplaincy because it's connected partly to this orthodox issue. And thank you, Dr. Kazanova, for your comments and discussion. And I think it's really important to discuss more on traditionalism issue. And that's not only about Ruskimi, but in general in all religions, because that's one of the key topics, I think, for the next research because we see it in different religious backgrounds and also in the secular narratives and i think that's one of the key topics for next uh networking and also uh i would just add a little bit that i think not only orthodoxy like in the main relig religion one of the biggest religion in ukraine but also protestants are really active for some reason, and we discuss it a lot with our sociologists, they're not so big in statistics, in quantitative statistics, but they're really big in their fields. So um, just, just to add a little bit. And uh, on the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, of course, uh, there is some generational change, but I would say there are two main factors that are actually influencing them. First, that who is your teacher and who is your spiritual leader, your personal spiritual teacher, if you are becoming a seminarist and then becoming a priest of Moscow Patriarchate in Ukraine. And it's really important just to understand, are you tied enough to the spiritual leader where you can be independent? So you are just raising up in a personal tradition of your spiritual leader. And it depends on how do you think and how do you act after that. And the second one, of course, next generation and younger priests are not so connected to the Moscow as it was before because they were not educated partly in Moscow, they were educated in Kyiv, and they, uh, their social ties are not with Russia only. They can be connected with Greece, with other uh, Orthodox people abroad, so they are much more open and they are not so, uh, they were not raised up in this post-Soviet system of understanding so they can be uh, fluent English speakers and learn more about theological works abroad. And that open up a total different world. And as I heard from several priests and bishops from UOC, in P, they're still waiting for this next generation to come. And of course, that will be needed a lot of years to change it. But still, there is some hope that new generation could change something. And uh, talking about USCMP and army, that's one of the actually changes because in 2014, not a lot of those uh, believers of USCMP went to serve on the front line because we've got more professional soldiers and officers who were serving there. Not all of them were mobilized and it was not so popular to become a volunteer serviceman. We got total different situation today. And uh, we can see it on a different examples. And as Dennis mentioned in our talks, we will got a big amount of veterans of Ukrainian army inside UOCMP, and we already get them. And you can see just a small example on a um, 
public discussion, public narrative on the boxer side with Alexander Usyk, who is one of the like, strong believers of USMP, and who was saying that Crimea is not Ukrainian, not Russian, but God's territory. And now he totally changed his narrative and claiming that he's Ukrainian and he's helping Ukrainian army. So it's more about changes of public narratives of those people who are connected to ECMP. And they, they've got this branch of uh, veterans inside their own church. And also talking about chaplaincy, because I saw this question about blessing arms, so how do chaplains act? Mainly Ukrainian chaplains, uh, they got their mission to stand behind and to stay together with soldiers. So in all their dilemmas, in all misunderstandings, in all trauma, killings, losing their relatives, they should be with them to stay on the front line for the whole period of time. And that's the main task for a military chaplain today. From the Russian side, I do not know a lot of military chaplains, unfortunately, because it's almost impossible to connect with them. And they're not so publicly visible as in Ukraine. But as we got it from public news and from uh, news feed from church sites, there are blessing arms mainly. And of course, one of the popular videos uh, from the recent week and week ago from Patrick Kirill, who is blessing on his public speech, uh, Russian people to come to be mobilized and to fight because it's their spiritual uh, responsibility to fight. So I think that's, of course, about different perspectives, but uh, Ukrainian military chaplaincy, as Dr. Kazanova said, it's more from uh, made from below, from grassroots, uh, from uh, religious leaders, and it's not so structured in as in Western Europe, as in US, because they, they created their own rules just uh, through their process of service. I hope that they asked, uh, answered just partly. Yes, great. Thank you very much, Tatiana. Um, and I wanted to invite either Jose or Dennis to to add anything to this point. I, I see, Jose, you, you had your hand raised. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, I wanted to say that the division is not so much between young and old Orthodox priests, but between bishops and priests. It was uh, when the Thomas took place, it was supposed to reunify the two Orthodox churches, the Autocephalus and the KU Patriarchate, that was not canonical, and sectors of the Orthodox Church, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarchate. 15 bishops were supposed to have joined. At the end, only two bishops joined. But it was the priest that joined. Uh, uh, and the, some of the laity, which play a crucial role in the reunification of the new church, and they're the most intellectual resources for the new church. I want to point out in the footnote 35 of the report, you have the very, very, the, the text of the very important document, 10 Theses for the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, that was jointly written and signed by priests from both, from the Orthodox Church of Ukraine and Ukraine Orthodox Church. And many of the, my very close friends, precisely who had been members of the Moscow Patriarchate and they joined the new church, people like Konstantin Sikhov, uh, uh, arts, uh, uh, arts uh, priest uh, Kovalenko, even the Cyril Hoborun, those are very important intellectual figures that are going to play a crucial role in developing this theology for peace, this ethos of war. There are many, many projects of developing precisely these discussions, communication, and even reconciliation between Ukraine Orthodoxy and Russian Orthodoxy. Great, thank you very much, Jose. Um, so we had a number of questions asking about the role of specific religious groups within Ukraine. Um, there was one about the uh, Kiev Jewish Messianic Congregation that Dr. Kalinichenko already answered in the chat box. Um, so let me just put a selection of these uh, to you uh, panelists very briefly. We have one person asking about uh, the role of the Mennonite Central Committee and other Anabaptist entities, obviously the M M Mennonite have been very closely associated with, with peace work. Um, we have one uh, clarification question about the Protestant groups asking which Protestant denominations specifically you're referring to when you talk about what you characterize as the Protestant dilemma. And let me also take this opportunity 
um, to um, uh, draw your attention to a question about how the voice of women theologians and activists are being taken into account at present. So back, back, back to the panel with those questions. Yeah, we'll try to be quick. And I think that's really important also to raise a live a question from Professor Catherine Warner. Thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. And about possible theology of peace, because it's one of the crucial questions. Uh, so just quickly about Mennonite Central Committee. That's actually one of our partners with whom we're working on peace building field. Uh, Mennonites are not the biggest com uh, community in Ukraine, but still MCC is really active in Ukraine and supporting different religious and non-religious initiatives in peace building. So they are trying to prolong their activities through grassroots level and trying to help. And they're really active since February 2022. And uh, hopefully we will continue our dialogue connection thanks to them. Also um, about Protestants. So I mean different Protestant denominations because it's like a collective image of them, but mainly Baptists, Pentecostals, and Evangelicals as the most active in Ukraine. Of course, they got different positions. And if we take into account Baptists, they're more conservative as uh, publicly, uh, and Pentecostals and Evangelicals more, more liberal communities, but not in a, in a way of a liberal understanding in European view. But actually, um, I would say that it's, it's a clash because you can see some official statements from Baptist and Evangelical unions from Russia that are claiming and blessing Putin. So that's a totally different worldview. And they were trying to establish any kind of public discourse or public connection, but it's not possible now. And uh, what I put on my slides is, uh, please die in silence because it was one of the messages from Russian Protestants to Ukrainian Protestants. So please do not write about your war. Do not describe what do you see because as Christian people, you need to die in silence. And that's like a main message if you're a spiritual person. Also, there was a quick question uh, on this slide. There's a picture of Jesus Christ uh, ex exiting uh, some shelter it says in Ukrainian, the air, end of air alarm, like everyone is just going to the shelter and back when we got alarms. So it's what's like a vision of this. Uh, and uh, taking into account women's theology and also theology of peace. I know several really good attempts to put a uh, question of women's theology and women in theology abroad and especially in orthodoxy. And I know that some colleagues are really active in this field. But unfortunately, it's not so active in Ukraine now. Hopefully, we will get it more. And hopefully, we'll get open discussion. But it's not up to date right now. We've got those women activists who are uh, taking part in this Bucha Theology Conference, young theologians in uh, Hust in the Zakarpatia. But it's not like the main part of it. And mainly, women are really active in social service, not as in theology. So probably, we will get more works after war ends and it's possible to see something in few years. And taking into account theology of peace, as it was one of our topics in this uh, experimental, I would say, group of uh, chaplains, which we have for one year. And one of the key issues is like, who should be those theologians of peace? And we were discussing together with our colleague Taras Dyatlik in comparative theology, that it's possible for those chaplains, for those religious leaders who are active on the ground to describe the experience, to describe their spiritual understandings and to build up as a piece of theology of peace understanding and theology of war, so in comparison to it. And if, uh, if you ask them, so what would you like to focus, theology of war or theology of peace? They are uh, claiming more for peace because they are thinking in strategic long-term perspective because they still want to plan something after the end of war. And it is possible to understand that somehow religious leaders, communities, and churches should be in the center of those who are forming the theology, but on, not only describing what was done by them. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Um, 
I encourage all of you to read the new report on Ukrainian religious actors and organizations after Russia's invasion, The Struggle for Peace, that has just been published by the Berkeley Center, if you'd like to learn more about these topics. Most of all, I'm grateful to our panelists today, Drs. Kalenichenko, Brilov, and Casanova, for sharing their expertise with us. Tetiana and Dennis, um, wearing my other hat as a senior advisor at the U.S. Institute of Peace. It's been, it's been such a pleasure to work closely with you and learn so much from both of you over the last few years, and I'm looking forward to our ongoing collaboration. I want to say a big thank you to Imogen Johnson, the events manager at the Berkeley Center, for um, handling so ably the logistics that made today's session possible, and I want to thank all of you uh, in the audience for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon at another Berkeley Center event. Take care, everyone, and goodbye.